So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Juliet Creighton. Uh, she's a research and application scientist at Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. Having finished her PhD studies in molecular modeling of enzyme reaction mechanisms at the University of Bristol in 2009, she spent two years in a postdoctoral position on pharmacophore methods at Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical Research Center at Windlesham here in the UK before joining the CCDC in Cambridge in 2011. Her current role includes providing scientific support for all user communities, particularly in the discovery chemistry area, and acting as the main point of contact for all scientific matters for the CCDC's major pharmaceutical and agrochemical partners. She also contributes to the teaching and outreach activities of the CCDC and is co-supervising two students with Professor Yav at the University of Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, my name, as I say, is uh, Matthew Siegel. I'm the CEO here at Optibrium. Um, and after Juliet's uh, presentation, I'll be talking a little bit about our work with CCDC and the integration of gold with Stardrop. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Juliet, who's going to tell us about protein ligand docking with gold. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk on protein ligand docking with gold, uh, which the CCDC, the uh, Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, develops and distributes to our users. So I wanted to briefly give a really brief introduction to the CCDC. For those of you who might not know us, um, we are first of all an interaction, uh, an international data repository. So we archive all of the world's organic and metallo-organic small molecule crystal structures in the CSD, the Cambridge Structural Database. At the moment, it's got uh, over 920,000 entries, and it's growing at a rate at about 70,000 entries each year. We're also scientific software providers, and I will give an overview of one of our tools today, uh, which is the Gold Suite. We also do fundamental research in collaboration with academia and or industry. Um, we are an independent, not-for-profit organization established over 50 years ago, and we are based on two sites. Our main site uh, is in Cambridge in the UK, and our second smaller site is in New Jersey, where it's co-located with the PDB at Rutgers University. And overall, there are about 65 of us uh, across these two sites. So in this presentation, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Gold as a docking program. Um, and I suppose I may be uh, speaking to an audience who already know what a docking program is, but um, it's good to define it as an algorithm for generating reasonable binding poses uh, for a candidate ligand in the active site. It consists of two parts. First of all, you will have a pose generation step, and then the second will be a pose evaluation step. And the second step is where it uses a scoring function. So in terms of um, the primary use of a docking program, uh, first of all, there is the identification of reasonable binding poses for an active molecule. So this informs the development of a uh, structure activity relationship and is very valuable for deciding the next direction of molecular design. Also, the docked poses are useful starting points for more sophisticated calculations. For example, to calculate a binding affinity uh, or to probe the binding event. And there you'd use, for example, QMMM calculations or MD simulations. The uh, second uh, primary use of docking programs is to screen thousands and thousands of candidate ligands uh, in silico, and this is what we call virtual screening. And I suppose it is important to point out that when you do uh, virtual screening, um, you use docking as part of a screening funnel, then you do not trust only the scoring function scores alone to prioritize your ligand for further uh, investigation. So coming back to GOLD itself, um, GOLD is a program that has a very long history, actually. It started off uh, in 1995. The initial GOLD work was uh, a case collaboration between Sheffield and Wellcome, uh, and this comprised um, Garris' Jones PhD. 
then uh, when Gareth started his PhD, his postdoc, uh, a little bit later, the CCDC contributed scientifically to the project by um, constructing the very first large test set uh, for validation. At the time, it had 100 structures. Um, it was in 97 that uh, the CCDC started to actually commercialize gold. Uh, at that point, the CCDC um, was completely responsible for the program. And over the years, there have been a number of developers who have worked on gold, and some of them you might already know. Um, Names, for example, like Marcel Verdun, Jason Cole, William Nissing, Simon Bowden, Oliver Koch. Um, but there have been um, a really a lot of developers. In recent years, uh, since uh, the year 2000, the CCDC has started collaborating with Aztecs, both on the development of test sets as well as the development of new features in gold. So this has resulted, for example, um, in uh, the uh, Aztec statistical potential uh, scoring function as well as the flexible handling of water molecules. Uh, and new for the uh, release that we've just done in, at the end of this November, uh, pharmacophore constraints. And I will touch a little bit more on all of these aspects um, later in the presentation. So the gold docking algorithm, the way it works um, is uh, that uh, the population of potential solutions, so that is all the possible docked orientations of the ligand, is set up at random. Each member of the population is encoded as a chromosome, and then these potential solutions are generated by mapping the ligand uh, hydrogen bond uh, atoms onto the complementary protein hydrogen bond atoms and again mapping hydrophobic points on the ligand onto protein hydrophobic points. The chromosome for the pose also encodes the confirmation around flexible ligand bonds and the protein OH groups. Um, then each chromosome is assigned a fitness score. This is using one of the scoring functions, and I will uh, tell you a little bit about the scoring functions in a bit. And the chromosomes within the populations are then ranked according to their fitness score. So for gold, um, the, because it has a genetic algorithm underneath, um, then the population of chromosomes is iteratively optimized using this genetic algorithm. And it's going to search both the, uh, the binding space as well as the ligand conformational space. Something to note um, is that gold is stochastic, so you're never going to get exactly the same solution on repeat. There are a number of things to note when setting up a gold docking. So first of all, gold uses an all-atom model, so the ligand must have all hydrogen atoms added prior to docking it into the active site. Um, also, the geometrical position of rotatable hydrogen atoms, that is hydroxyl and amino groups, will be optimized during the gold run. In terms um, of the protonation state, uh, this is very important to think about protonation state, ionization, tautomeric state, etc. of your ligands prior to docking, because if you have uh, an incorrect uh, ionization or tautometric state, then you might uh, end up with errors. So if you're unsure of what is the correct ionization or tautometric state of your ligand, then you should perform separate gold runs using the different possibilities. A final thing to note is that gold ignores the atom charges, uh, both formal and partial, that you might supply in your input file. And gold instead is going to deduce whether an atom is charged by counting the bond orders of the bond that it forms and comparing the results with the atom's normal valency. In terms of the starting input confirmation that you're giving into gold, so the ligand uh, must have reasonable bond lengths or uh, valence angles because gold is not going to alter any of these. So the ligand must be built in a good starting confirmation. Um, you may wish, for example, to use the CSD confirmer generator to minimize uh, the bond lengths and the valence angles to the local minimum, um, as found as those that have the highest occurrence in the Cambridge Structural Database, the CSD. Also, um, the stereochemistry of the ligand cannot be varied by gold, so you must decide a priori what is the stereochemistry of your ligand. Again, if you're not sure, you will have to, to generate two different uh, stereochemistries and do two different gold runs. And something else as well to note is that when you supply uh, your ligand um, in the initial confirmation for gold, the actual values of the torsion angles um, and the ring confirmation to a certain extent do not, ver do not matter because these will be varied by gold. Um, what um, the paper listed at the bottom of this slide, what it has shown is that actually 
gold is a program that's least affected by the, um, the ligand uh, starting geometry. So this is something else to note. So let us now consider the ligand and how the ligand is stirred for different conformations during docking. So gold inherently deals with ligand flexibility by including um, fully rotatable bonds and the flipping of planar nitrogens uh, as well as ring corner flipping. Gold also includes some ring templates and these allow um, the, the sampling of ring conformations derived from the CSD during the docking run. So we're using a knowledge-based ring geometry library and it has been shown to improve both the post-prediction and the score. The ligand conformations um, can also uh, be scored by an internal force field and this is what we call the internal energy offset. And finally, the torsion angle distributions, which again are extracted from the Cambridge Structural Database, are used by gold. Um, and they're used to restrict the ligand conformational space, which is sampled by the genetic algorithm. So I mentioned uh, just earlier that using ring templates can improve both the post prediction and the score obtained. So this is for the uh, 1Q, 1G example. And Something else that's good to note is that when you do make use of the ring template facility, it removes any possible bias um, that you might have introduced during the 2D to 3D conversion, if that is how you generated your ligands. And another advantage of this ring template um, is that you do not have to generate multiple ring confirmations and dock these independently, so you are saving, um, saving setting up time and saving docking run time. So I mentioned um, that, there must, that there are several scoring functions that are implemented in gold. You can use um, these four different scoring functions. There is also one rescore function which is available in gold. So looking at the scoring function, the first one listed on the page here is gold score. This is the, this is the original scoring function, the first one to have been developed. It's made up of uh, four components, the protein ligand hydrogen bond energy the protein ligand van der Waals energy, the ligand internal van der Waals energy, and finally the ligand torsional strain energy. The second scoring function to have been introduced is chem score, and this was derived empirically from a set of 82 protein ligand complexes for which there were measured binding affinity data that was available. Unlike gold score, the chem score function was trained by regression against measure affinity data, but I wanted to say that actually there is no clear indication that it is superior to gold score in predicting affinities, and in fact, um, we do not claim that any of the scoring functions generally are able to um, allow you to predict binding affinities. You really need much more rigorous calculations that uh, that take many other parameters in, in account, and you really cannot use docking to predict a binding affinity. So the first two scoring functions that I mentioned, these are traditional scoring functions. They're based on force field for the first one or on regression for the second one. The, the third scoring function, this ASP or ASTEC statistical potential, um, it uses a different approach. So in this one, the information about the frequency of interaction between ligand and protein atoms is gathered by analyzing existing protein ligand structures in the PDB, and then this information is used to generate the statistical potentials. Finally, our most uh, recent scoring function uh, is the ChemPLP scoring function. So it contains a consensus score. It combines element of chem score, hence the chem, and elements of of the PLP scoring function, hence the PLP part, uh, which stands for pairwise linear potential. And the advantage is that it models the steric complementarity between the protein and the ligand, um, and has now become the default scoring function in gold. And I'll, I'll briefly touch on that in a minute. Um, I just wanted to mention that we have um, a final scoring function, ChemScore RDS, um, which is only used for rescoring. Um, you are also able to define your own scoring functions using the goal scoring function API. It's written in C or C++. And actually, a lot of the questions that we get asked um, is, well, which scoring function should I use and when? You have these four scoring functions. And in general, goal score is usually very good for border binding sites. 
we tend to recommend ChemScore for lipophilic binding sites. Um, ASP performs well. We found that actually it's best employed for rescoring experiments and for this purpose ChemScore RDS has also been found to be very useful to rescore virtual screening runs. Um, ChemPLP is very fast, it's possibly also more accurate than Gold Score, and it's now the default scoring function in Gold, so we recommend that in the first attempt you try using ChemPLP over the other scoring functions. I just wanted to really briefly mention that there also we have um, some target specific parameters, so there are some chem score and goal score parameters which have been developed for the heme group in cytochrome P450. Uh, there are also some chem score parameters for kinases um, and we have a number of virtual screening protocols that have been optimized depending on the nature of the target, so this includes um, folate enzymes, uh, kinases, metalloproteases, uh, serine proteases and I believe a couple more. So if you have a particular target uh, for virtual screening, you might use one of these uh, virtual screening protocols. So I mentioned that ChemPLP is today the default scoring function in gold, and you may wonder well, well, why is that the case. So I'm going to really briefly touch on the test and validation that were done as part of the Spring ACS meeting in 2011, um, where the organizers of the Docking and Scoring Symposium organized a post-prediction and virtual screening challenge. Um, so this challenge provided standardized test sets and conditions. Uh, yes, they allowed us to evaluate gold against other docking packages, but really they also allowed us to compare in a standardized way all of our scoring functions against each other, so these four scoring functions implemented in gold. So one of the conclusions from the docking challenge is actually that gold performs very well for post-prediction um, compared to uh, the other 11 docking packages for which results were submitted. Uh, for docking package number one, you see no results have been submitted. So without naming any of these packages individually, gold performs really very well. Um, if you look um, at uh, the results for docking package number 12, Yes, it does appear to give a better post-prediction performance than gold for both uh, for both uh, the one angstrom and the two angstrom RMSD cutoffs, but it's worth saying that um, this docking protocol had a much smaller binding site definition uh, than what was used in gold, and it, it's possible that this would have artificially biased the tool uh, towards finding good solutions. So looking now at the comparison of all four goal scoring functions for post prediction, so the first thing to note, if you look in the top ranked uh, columns, uh, you should be able to see that ChemPLP outperforms all of the scoring functions, both at the two angstrom RMSD cutoff as well as the one angstrom RMSD cutoff. In addition, the values in the closest columns, um, so these give an estimate of the maximum achievable top rank success rate, assuming that you have a perfect ranking scoring function. So if we are going to compare the closest values with the top rank values, we see that the smallest difference um, is for ChemPLP at the two angstrom uh, RMSD cutoff. So the difference is between 93 and 87. So this is a 6% difference. Uh, and this is the smallest difference. If you look at gold score, the difference between, let's say, 88 and 78 is 10. Um, chem score, 91 and 82 is 9 percent, and for ASP, 89 and 79 percent, the difference is 10 percent. So the smallest difference is 6 percent for ChemPLP, and what that tells us is that ChemPLP is also the best at ranking binding poses, and this is quite important. So overall, um, we have a very respectable post-prediction rate, 87 percent for ChemPLP at a two angstrom RMSD cutoff, and we've also identified that ChemPLP is the best at ranking the binding poses. How did the scoring functions do for virtual screening? So these results, if you look at them overall, they suggest that actually for, for the particular data set that was involved uh, in, this, in the docking challenge, and this was the, the DUD data set, the Directory of Useful Decoys, ChemPLP has a slight edge uh, over the other scoring functions. If you look um, at the performance of the ASP uh, scoring function, actually it's not statistically worse, and this is also why we say that ASP can be very good uh, for virtual screening, um, along with ChemPLP. So the standard conclusions of these tests is really you should really make use of ChemPLP. We've, we've put it as the default scoring function of gold um, because it's highly effective for both post-prediction and virtual screening. It's also fast. It's about four times faster than gold scores. 
So this is also something to take into account. We also found that CAMPLP was the scoring function that was least affected by 2D property bias. So 2D property bias, um, what this means is that we test all scoring functions to see if we have enrichment when retrieving actives for target one, when screening against protein target two. And of course you want uh, the least enrichment possible. And we found that CAMPLP is the scoring function that had the least enrichment. So it has the one that has the least um, the least 2D property bias. So the conclusion is that we really recommend that you use CAMPLP unless, unless you have prior docking data that shows that actually another scoring function is more effective at reproducing the results that you already have. Or if you have a really highly lipophilic binding site, in which case you probably should try ChemScore in the first instance. So I mentioned metalloproteases earlier when talking about virtual screening uh, protocols available. So the question is, okay, is gold able to handle metals? The answer is yes. It's actually fairly good at handling metals and automatically assigning a geometry during protein initialization. So the protein has to be set up correctly. Um, what this means is that you have to delete any protein metal bonds in the original file if these exist. But then during the protein initialization, initialization, gold is going to map uh, the different available geometry templates, for example, tetrahedral, octahedral. It's going to map these geometry templates onto the metal and its coordinated protein atoms. And then it determines which of these geometry templates is the best fit based on the RMSD. So once the best matching template has been identified and selected, then coordination points are generated and the ligand is simply mapped on. Now, if gold doesn't get it right, generally it's very good, um, but if it doesn't get it right, or let's say you have a geometry that the metal must absolutely have, you're perfectly able to override the gold's metal geometry and you can specify your geometry explicitly. So you can also, for awkward geometries, maybe in square plane, that you can define your own geometry and enforce that in gold. So you, the user always has absolute control over these. Now, in gold, um, it's possible to model water, model water molecules explicitly. Um, this is very important. Um, I'm sure, as you probably know, water molecules can, in some cases, play a very key role in ligand binding uh, by mediating interactions between the ligand and the protein. It could be that a water molecule um, is displaced by an appropriate ligand, and we have to take that into account and somehow model it into gold. So if you set up a gold docking with um, water molecules treated explicitly, then there will be switches that will be added into the chromosome. And these switches can allow the state of the water to change. Uh, it can change between the water molecules being always present or always absent or either present or absent, and it can flip between the two during the docking. It's also possible to specify that the relative orientation of the water is able to change. So this is equivalent to spinning the water molecule. And finally, the water molecules can also be allowed to move a little bit within the binding site. And this is using this trans-spin option. Uh, and the waters can translate um, by up to uh, one angstrom within the binding site. There are many different constraints which are available in gold. Um, these are very popular and they're used to include in your docking any known um, a priori information about the protein ligand system. So for example, you can use constraints to uh, ensure that key hydrogen bonding interactions are fulfilled. For this, you might use the, the general uh, hydrogen bond constraint or the more specific protein hydrogen bond constraint. You can also use constraints to bias the docking towards a known binding motif. Um, another really popular constraint in gold is the ability to perform covalent docking, where you specify the single attachment point of your ligand to a particular protein residue in your binding site. It's worth saying that in the latest version of gold, which we released in November, we have really improved uh, the interface for setting up some of these constraints. Something else as well that we've uh, done in the last version of Gold, which is version 5.6. Um, so we have added a new constraint. Um, this was constraint was developed with Aztecs Pharmaceuticals. Um, this is the pharmacophore constraint. So this constraint is quite similar to the region constraint in that it rewards occupation-specific regions of the binding site. 
But here, when pharmacophore constraints are defined, there is a positive contribution which is added to the fitness score of a docking pose if the atoms of a particular pharmacophore types are located within a particular region of the binding sites. Um, the ligand itself is uh, annotated with pharmacophore points, and these pharmacophore points can be of uh, the type, the H-bond acceptor type or the H-bond donor type, uh, either H-bond donor or acceptor, and then you also have aromatic ring centers and non-aromatic ring centers, or actually non-specified uh, ring centers. Something else which is um, accounted for in gold is the uh, aspect of protein flexibility. So there are two different approaches um, that gold um, can use to deal with protein flexibility. So the first way is with side chain rotamers. You can define up to 10 different side chains as flexible using these side chain rotamers. Um, this is done using uh, rotomer libraries, which are implemented in terms of chi angles. Um, these rotomer libraries, they have not been developed by the CCDC, but rather they are taken from uh, the paper that's listed at the bottom of the slide, the penultimate rotomer libraries paper. So you're either able to use the rotomer libraries um, that are already implemented in gold, but you can also specify uh, which torsions the side chains are able to adopt. Uh, either you enter the specific torsion angles or you specify that the torsion angle must remain within a specified range. So you have really complete control um, over the rotomers that are explored um, by gold during protein ligand docking. Also worth noting that the side chain and protein clashes are accounted for when you use side chain rotomers. And the user, again, uh, can control any additional um, energy penalization to be added to the fitness score. So this is the first way in which, deal, uh, in which gold is able to deal with protein flexibility. It is particularly appropriate when you have uh, flexibility of side chains within the binding site. But what if you have larger flexibility? What if you have different conformations of the protein? In that case, you would use the ensemble docking approach. So let us consider why we may wish to use ensemble docking. So these results um, are for a virtual screen um, for eight of the dot sets listed here. Um, and we dock the actives and the decoys for each target into the hollow protein structures uh, which came from the Aztecs non-native set for that particular target. And then we calculated standard enrichment metrics, so this is where you've got uh, the enrichment factor and the AUC which are presented here. And overall what this shows, if you look at the graph on the left hand side, what it shows is that there can be quite a difference in the retrieval of the actives depending on which protein structure you use. If you use um, the, worst, um, the worst structure, then you will have the results in red. The best structure is the results in green. And depending on which protein structure you pick, you can have very, very um, different uh, performance. Uh, if you look at the, um, the graph on the right-hand side, this shows that actually this behavior can be even more marked for early enrichment. And of course, uh, in a retrospective study, you might, um, you might be able to see which protein uh, structure is the best, which one is the worst. But if you're starting from a project where all you have are the different protein structures, then you don't know which one is the best, which one is the worst. So it would be nice to have a way of mitigating against the risk of picking the worst structure. And this is where ensemble docking really comes into it. So you can take all of the protein structures for your target and because gold requires a single binding site definition which must be applicable across all of these structures, you will first need to um, superimpose these protein structures. Um, so if you use um, the Hermes visualizer which is provided as part of the gold suite, um, there's a superimposed protein options and you can simply follow the, the instructions to superimpose your protein. Either um, it will use a, a component of the FASTA package or if these are not installed, um, there is also an inbuilt uh, Needleman Wunsch algorithm. And both of these algorithms really do the same thing. They generate a global sequence alignment that give a pairwise matching of one residue to another, and then you can use that for the overlay. So the gold algorithm is going to search all of these protein confirmations, which you have superimposed, and it's going to search all of these protein confirmations concurrently, and it will hop between the different protein structures whilst exploring the ligand conformational space and the binding site space at the same time. 
there is a hard-coded maximum limit of 20 proteins um, to be used while ensemble docking, but we don't actually recommend using more than 10 proteins because more will actually impact the performance of the program. So in the next slide after this, I'm going to show a, a really a short video that illustrates um, the results of ensemble docking. So this is uh, the uh, this is a thymidine kinase example. So we have provided uh, to Gold several protein models, and they have different confirmations of this glutamine one two five residue. So the Gold docking also included uh, three water molecules which were treated explicitly, this um, water 1, water 2 and water 3 listed here. They could either be present or absent and if you can see uh, one of the confirmations, actually two of the confirmations of the glutamine 125 side chain actually results in the displacement of this water 1 molecule. And the water molecules were also allowed to spin and then to, to locally translate by up to one angstrom within the binding site. Um, I should also mention that this is a non-native docking so that the protein model which contains the ligand being docked has not been included in the ensemble of proteins provided to gold. So the short video shows how gold, first of all, samples different protein models, um, which include uh, the different conformations of the glutamine 125 site chain. It also allows the water molecules to rotate, translate, and turn on and off, and therefore be displaced um, by some of the conformations of the glutamine side chain. And overall, this allowed um, gold to identify correctly uh, the ligand binding pose for this ligand. So this is a, a, a simple. Um, this is a small uh, of the a small subset of the results um, for uh, the uh, gold ensemble virtual screening study that we did. So this is for the dud set um, containing PDE5 actives and decoys, and these actives and the decoys were docked into all the protein models that are listed. So you have five different protein models, and the area under the curve and the enrichment factor statistics. Six at the time were calculated with a gold mine, but now you would be able to really easily calculate all of these enrichment uh, metrics uh, using the CSD Python API. So if you look at the figure on the left hand side, so using the ensemble docking methodology, you see that uh, there is uh, an AUC statistic of about 0 0.7, um, and uh, on the right hand side, the enrichment factor at 5% is about 8.5. So the figure on the left shows that the ensemble docking experiment um, using the ensemble docking methodology outperforms most of the individual protein models except for one TBF where you have the you have the same um, essentially the same performance. The figure on the right hand side now illustrates um, that the ensemble docking methodology outperforms all of the individual protein models when we're looking at early enrichment. Of course, this is just one example. This is for the PDE5 example. This will not necessarily be applicable and seen across all of the different target classes, but it really shows that actually there are times when using ensemble docking can uh, give you excellent early enrichment uh, results compared to using uh, sequential docking. So what I hope I've been able to show you is that GOLD is a very versatile program for protein ligand docking. Some of the key items to remember are that it has four different scoring functions as well as a rescore function, which means that you have a greater chance of finding a protocol that suits your particular system, your particular target. Um, GOLD can deal with key water molecules, uh, allowing them to rotate, translate, and turning them on and off during the docking run. It has uh, two features for dealing with protein flexibility. This is the rotatable side chains and the ensemble docking approach, and these are very useful and they are very widely used in the docking community. And also, um, gold contains several different constraints, including uh, the hydrogen bond constraint, the hydrophobic region constraint, scaffold, similarity constraints. Um, what is also important to note is that we distribute gold as part of the CSD discovery suite. Um, and Gold also is integrated into third-party interfaces. So this includes uh, Biovia's Pipeline Pilot as well as Discovery Studio. It includes the MOE interface from CCG. And more recently, it includes the Stardrop interface from Optibrium. So I wanted to close this presentation, of course, by saying thank you very much uh, for your attention on this. If there are any questions, I know that there is a, 
uh, an ability to, to set questions on the side. And then I leave you with an email address if you think that uh, this is a useful tool. Then feel free, please, to get in touch with myself or directly with my uh, administration colleagues who will be more than happy to help. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Juliet, for a fascinating overview of gold and its many different flexible options. Now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing in terms of linking gold through Stardrop's POSE generation interface. Now I know that some of you in the audience are, are not familiar with our Stardrop software, so I'm just going to use a few slides just to introduce Stardrop and its capabilities. And what you'll see is that Stardrop is a very comprehensive package of integrated software for small molecule design optimization and data analysis. Uh, here at Optibrium, we focus very much on cutting-edge science and pushing the boundaries of new methods and new technologies, and also working with leading organizations who are developing science in their own uh, specific areas of expertise, and making those available through a very intuitive, very user-friendly interface. I'll just briefly cover the fact that uh, Stardrop is a modular suite of software. Many of those we develop in-house from our research and development groups here, but also, as I mentioned, working with our leading partners for example, LASA Limited, um, predictive toxicity, Cresset on 3D ligand-based design, uh, NextMove, Biosolve IT, and many others. And SOC also offers many capabilities for very flexible integration and customization, which of course is relevant to our discussion today and the work we've been doing with CCDC. In terms of the core features of Stardrop, it's really focused around the idea of guiding decisions in terms of the selection of high quality molecules for a specific drug discovery objective using both experimental and predicted data, but then also in terms of the design of the next round of compounds to improve those properties that we're looking for and the chance of success downstream. And here I've just listed some of those sort of core features, including our probabilistic scoring algorithm, which is our unique approach to multi-parameter optimization, enabling a project to define the property profile that you require and quickly target high-quality compounds with your specific objectives. You can map this information across the chemical space that you're exploring and the diversity of compounds um, to identify the hotspots, the close analogs and series that have that best overall chance of success, and think about strategies for selection of compounds to move forward that balance the quality with an appropriate exploration of diversity to avoid missed opportunities and make sure that we're confirming our hypotheses before progressing too far on one particular route. Stardrop also provides a very comprehensive environment for data visualization, including our unique card view approach that helps you to organize and work with the data and the relationships between compounds, the way that you're thinking about them in your drug discovery project. And the ability to do structure activity and relationship analysis to understand those relationships that are driving optimization in your chemical series. And of course, having looked at the data we have already, the next thing we want to do is to consider new strategies for optimization and interactive design linked with the glowing molecule that uses predictive models to map onto the structure of your compounds the regions predicted have a strong influence on properties that are relevant to your, your project and guide that design of the next round of compounds to improve the balance and chance of success. And then, as I mentioned, Stardrop has several plug-in modules that extend those core capabilities. There are nine plug-in modules that provide a very comprehensive range of computational chemistry and cheminformatics capabilities. And I've just summarized them all on this slide, and I won't go through them in detail, but they include uh, predictive models, QSAR models, and the ability to build your own, uh, quantum mechanical models of people to see metabolism, the Derrick Nexus module in collaboration with LASA for predicting the toxicity, the NOVA and Biostar modules, which are focused on de novo design and generating and prioritizing new relevant compound ideas to explore new optimization strategies. Torch 3D with Cresset, looking at 3D ligand-based design and understanding and identifying uh, novel active compounds. The CSAR module, which is a collaboration with Biosolve IT, which provides a visualization interface for linking the sort of 2D SAR analysis with that 3D structure-based design information. And NPO Explore, which provides a set of patented algorithms for helping to uh, identify the optimal multi-parameter optimization strategies for your project. 
But what I just wanted to focus on is the pose generation interface in Startup, and this was the driver behind our collaboration with CCDC. Obviously, within Stardrop, there are many capabilities for the design of compounds, but we wanted to link those with structure-based design methods, such as gold, so that users could very quickly run docking, pharmacophore, or confirmation generation calculations directly from Stardrop as they're considering new ideas and new strategies for optimization, and ensure that medicinal chemists using Stardrop could get very quick feedback on new compound designs in terms of that sort of 3D protein ligand interaction. The results from the pose generation interface are returned for analysis and visualization in Stardrop. So the ligand poses, corresponding protein structures, and docking scores are returned to Stardrop. And those 3D structures can be visualized very easily in the CSAR module. And this supports flexible docking. Uh, so as we've seen in gold, the ensemble docking method uh, can have different protein conformations. And so this can support that and return a different protein conformation for each ligand pose generated. And the concept here is that uh, Stardrop provides a very easy, easy user-friendly interface to run and analyze the results of these docking calculations. But the expert computational chemists uh, working with full platforms like Gold and the full user interface and all the flexibility that Juliet described can very easily develop and validate the 3D models of their protein targets and publish those very, very easily by simply dropping the configuration files on the server uh, which then makes them available to all Stardrop users. And now we recognize that uh, although Gold is a very important platform, there are many other 3D modeling platforms available. And so we've implemented this as a very flexible Python API, which can actually accommodate pretty much all of the major docking platforms and also provides the ability to customize the docking process to your requirements or extend it to additional docking platforms. And also, of course, docking calculations you know, take some time to run, particularly for large data sets. And so we've also implemented a server that manages this queuing and batch processing of long calculations um, and, and sort of takes that strain off of the desktop. And also, uh, this can be very flexibly accommodate uh, HPC queuing systems uh, for organizations that have large clusters set up. And it looks something like this, uh, Stardrop links to the pose generation server that we've implemented. The pose generation server has workers, and a very flexible Python wrapper connects the workers to whichever docking platform that you use. And of course, we were very pleased to work with CCDC. They were the first organization that collaborated with us to provide access to gold and support in integrating it with the pose generation server. Since then, we've extended it to many different docking and alignment platforms. Um, and, in fact, more than are listed on this slide as well. So, just to give you a quick feeling for what this looks like, I'm just going to drop out of the slides and uh, just show you a quick example in Stardrop itself. Um, and what I have here is an example based on HIV-1 protease. Um, and here I'm showing the structure with a, a ligand from the crystal structure, in this case, uh, a peptidic ligand, uh, JG365. And if I just zoom into the binding site here, this is using the CSAR module, you can see the, the binding confirmation. Um, and particularly, I'm just going to focus in here where you can see this sort of arrangement right in the core with the uh, two carbonyl groups uh, that interact actually with a water that's not shown here with also, and also these two uh, amide nitrogens in the backbone. Now, we've actually removed the water from this structure because what we want to do is actually look for strategies for small molecule design uh, that use uh, that displace that water as a strategy for uh, gaining uh, potency and affinity. And here is that one ligand uh, that has actually been proposed for this. It's a cyclic lactam, and if I click on this, the docking result from gold is shown here in the same structure. And indeed, we can see a, a very nice pose generated. Let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, you can see these two hydroxyl groups forming very nice hydrogen bonds. Uh, and this carbonyl group essentially displaces that water. And one hydrogen bond here is shown. The other uh, is not quite the right geometry in this docked pose. But one can see how it very nicely is accommodated in that binding environment. But of course, uh, a good pose, a good docking score, and indeed good affinity is only the starting point for a design strategy. And so 
What we might also want to do is consider some of the other properties that are of interest. And here within Stardrop, we have our ADME QSAR module. I'm just going to run a series of predictive ADME models to calculate physical chemical and ADME properties uh, here in the data set. It's just been added very, very quickly. And as I mentioned, uh, one focus we have is on this idea of multi-parameter optimization. And so I, I have a scoring profile that we've defined here, defining suitable properties for an oily dose compound for a non-CNS target, including good solubility, good human intestinal absorption, the right range of log P, avoiding Herg inhibition, and, and many other properties here. And if I run that, what it will do is generate a score for this compound that represents the likelihood of achieving the ideal outcome for each of those properties. Uh, and more importantly, for this example here, what you can also see, this histogram tells us uh, if there are any particular issues we should be aware of. And I guess the thing that stands out here are the, the low bars in this histogram. And we can see particularly the physical chemical properties. In red here, you can see the solubility. And in light blue, the log P, the bars are quite low. And therefore, uh, those might be a, a sort of a key factor that we'd like to optimize to find a higher quality ligand uh, for this particular objective. And what I've actually done um, is actually to use our NOVA module to generate a set of ideas. So what this does is take this molecule as a starting point and applies municipal chemistry transformation rules that represent commonly made optimization steps in the course of uh, lead optimization projects. And so here in the center, this blue molecule is actually that starting point. Um, and you can see it's generated two generations of compounds um, here by one set of transformations, and then the best of those uh, transformations have been applied to generate in green second generation. And if we look in a little bit more detail here, you can see that not surprisingly what it's done is taken some of the uh, lipophilic uh, substituents here and replaced those with more, more polar groups in an effort to increase the solubility and reduce the, the log P and generate an overall better profile of properties. You see all these bars are nice and high. And this overall score, this chance of success, is now much higher. Well, that's all very well and good. But of course, we also would like to see if these are actually uh, accommodated by the actual binding site and whether we can actually dock those with a, a similar uh, docking score, at least, to that initial starting point. And here is where we can now use this pose generation interface. And I can select these molecules that I've just generated. And I can link to the pose generation server. And what it does is it goes to the server and identifies all of the models that our computational chemists have, have published in whichever docking platform they particularly uh, want to use. And in this case, I'm just going to focus in on those uh, with the uh, gold platform. And here you can see my HIV-1 protease model. And if I click OK, what this does is it sends these compounds to the server. They're all queued up, and they're going to be run through the gold docking model for HIV-1 protease using that structure that I just showed you. What you can see is each of the compounds here has a little star, and that's just a little indicator to say that it's running on the server. And we're going to have to wait a little while in order to get those results back. Obviously, docking maybe takes 30 seconds to a minute per compound, and I'm just running it here on my laptop. If we connected this with a nice high-performance computing cluster, we could churn through these very, very quickly. And when they are finished, what you'll see is it actually returns a little number here uh, that tells us the uh, number of confirmations that have been generated by that docking run. And of course, that's a parameter that can be defined by the expert user when that, uh, when that model is published. And I think if we just wait another few seconds, hopefully all being well, it will return that value. And you, there we go. And you see the first one is completed and generated nine poses. And you can also see that uh, on the right-hand side here, it's added a new column. And there is that uh, PLP fitness function that Juliet was telling us about for that particular ligand. Now, as exciting as it is to sit here and watch all these compounds run, you'll be glad to hear that I've actually run them already. And I'm just going to switch over to a final data set where, where the only difference is I've actually completed those docking calculations. And uh, you can see number of poses generated for each of these compounds. So what we might want to do is combine the docking score generated with all of the other properties that we're looking for. And I've defined a 
CLP fitness score of 70 or above to be comparable with that initial uh, cyclic lactam that we saw. And if I click go, now we get a, a new score for each compound. Uh, and you'll see some of them, um, although they get a great score in terms of the ADME properties, you can see here the overall score when we take the docking score into account is not very good, whereas others are still doing very, very well. And if we sort these into descending order, you can see the highest overall score in terms of that balance of the fitness as well as the ADME properties is shown. And of course, what we want to do is have a look at some of the poses. And so changing back to the CSAR module, you can see we can go back and select each of these. And this is the uh, preferred pose shown here. Um, and again, you can see it's a very similar uh, binding confirmation shown here. You can also see that there are multiple um, confirmations generated, and we can easily change between those just by selecting the different poses from the table below. And so we can see several different strategies here um, where we've added polarity um, and retaining this still the same binding motif with the hydrogen bond from the hydroxyl group as well as from the carbon ion. Um, but we're adding now polarity off of the, the ring here to improve some of the physical chemical properties. And indeed, this is well accommodated, uh, at least according to our docking model, uh, by the binding site. Another strategy here you can see is adding polarity directly off the, uh, the lactam ring. In fact, here you can see an intramolecular hydrogen bond is predicted to be formed. So many different things that we can explore, but trying to find not only compounds that are predicted to dock well, but also to have the sorts of physical, chemical, and ADME properties that we require. Well, that's just a quick demonstration. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the slides now. And we are on to our question and answer session here. And I can already see that uh, several questions have come in. Um, so thank you very much for submitting those. And uh, I'm going to just uh, read some of those. Um, and I hopefully Juliet will be, be happy to answer. Uh, so the first question here I can see on this list is uh, how many amino acid residues are reasonable to make flexible in order to have valid docking procedure? So Juliet, I don't know if you have any opinions on that. Yes, so typically um, we've used uh, two to three residues uh, and treated those as flexible using the side chain rotamers, but you, you can absolutely have more than that. Um, it really depends how much time you're willing to spend on your docking. The more flexible rotamers you include, um, the longer your docking is going to take. So on average, we use two to three, but you're more than welcome to use more. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, I have a second question here, which says, uh, hello, I'm interested in docking studies for RNA and peptide binding. Would I be able to use a peptide structure drawn in Kendra on gold? And would I be able to use flexible RNA structures obtained from PDB? So thank you for this question. So there are sort of two aspects of the question. Uh, the first uh, question is, uh, the ability to use a peptide structure drawn on Kembo on gold. So the actual answer to this is not directly. So if you're drawing something in ChemDraw, it's a 2D structure, and gold requires both your ligand and your protein or your target to be supplied as a 3D. And whilst we can't do 2D to gold in our tool, you can use, for example, star drops. So you can use uh, a 2D uh, structure in star drop. Um, it allows you to then uh, get a 3D structure. You can use gold to generate results uh, and get poses. And then you can then use, again, star drop to look at the poses and, and do all the magic that you've just seen. So uh, actually, this is one of the reasons why such integrations are very useful. Um, so this is about, um, this was about answering the first part, the chem draw aspect. Uh, the other question is whether or not it's possible to use flexible RNA structures or, or why not DNA structures uh, obtained from the PDB. And the answer to that is a cautious yes. So um, yes, you're able to use RNA and DNA structures. Uh, we 
so gold has been explicitly parameterized to uh, reproduce the docking of small molecules into proteins. Um, and so it's not been parameterized for RNA and DNA. So it may be that you know you have to look at the fitness scores and remember that they have not been optimized for DNA or RNA. Uh, and something else to note on a very practical level, it may be that if you use DNA or RNA as your protein target, that the Hermes visualizer that you use to set up your goal docking is not going to be able to recognize the DNA or the RNA as a protein. It will um, classify it as a ligand. So it may be that you will need to use gold on the command line in order to generate your docking results. Um, and uh, you will definitely be able to do that. This is actually something that I've just done this afternoon for, for one of my colleagues. Um, and you will be able to look at the poses of your ligand into DNA or RNA using the Hermes interface. Great. Thanks, Juliet. Could you please say a little more about how ring flexibility with templates is handled in gold? Okay, so these um, these templates are extracted from the CSD as uh, archetypal rings, uh, and then the ring confirmation is included as a GA uh, setting. So what it means is that the GA is able to explore these different ring confirmations along with the rest of the ligand conformational space and the binding site space when it's uh, looking for poses. Um, I just wanted to mention that there is um, when you switch between the different CSD ring templates, there is a very small uh, local minimization that is done to improve the geometry of the attachment of the ring template to the remainder of your molecule. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, gosh, there's some more questions here. So uh, we have another one asking if you could or illustrate or at least describe some of the uh, speed performance and the time performance of gold. Um, this is a very uh, this is a very open question. By definition, the speed or the timing performance of gold really is going to depend on your on your docking. It's going to depend first of all on how large is your binding site, uh, and you can uh, you have a an ability to 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 really specify the size of the binding site in angstroms. Uh, it also will depend on the flexibility of your ligand. The more rotatable bonds uh, that your ligand has, the greater conformational space it has, and therefore, the more gold can spend time exploring the ligand conformational space or the binding site space. So, in terms of the the kind of the standard speed that we see, if you have a small ligand in uh, a, a, a a reasonable binding site, it's really about, it's just, it's get six seconds to obtain poses. If you have a re really large binding site, it might be that your ligand is going to take actually a couple of minutes. So it really depends on the problem that you have. Uh, and also it depends where you're using gold. Are you using gold on your desktop or are you using it perhaps in a cluster? And the final thing I wanted to say is there is an option to um, to generate uh, the automatic uh, genetic algorithm settings. And what this option does is Gold is going to make a heuristic estimate of uh, the best GA settings depending on the size of the ligand and the size of the binding site. So if you're not quite sure which GA settings to use, we would recommend using the automatic settings as this will really tailor um, how much time uh, Gold is able to spend on your ligand based on the problem, um, the ligand and the binding site that you're giving it. That's great. Thanks for such a, a comprehensive uh, answer. Um, all right, we're almost there. Just uh, two more to go. Uh, one, I think, is a, a simple question, which is, uh, where can I get information about licensing the gold package? Um, so if you're interested in licensing gold as part of the CSD discovery suite, um, really the best thing to do is to get in touch uh, with our um, with my admin colleagues. So the email address is admin at ccdc.cam.ac.uk. It's also on the last on the last <coughs> excuse me, the last slide of my presentation um, and they would be more than happy to discuss uh, any of the options available to you. Great. And uh, the last question is for me, <laughs> which is uh, is the visualization of poses, uh, does it require a CSAR license? Uh, and, and the answer to that is, is yes, the, the CSAR module is what provides that link between the sort of structure-based design information, the 3D protein ligand poses, and the other sort of 2D SAR information within Stardrop. 
So the, the CISO module is required for that. Um, and I should say anyone who's interested would be very happy to organize uh, an opportunity to try it yourself. And if you'd like to try that with the post generation space at the same time, again, we're happy to help you set that up. So uh, that's the end of our questions. I'll just wait another few seconds in case there's any sort of last minute thoughts or questions. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for attending and taking the time uh, today to, to listen to our presentations. And I hope we'll see you at our next webinar early in the new year.